Hey folks, Jason Pye uh, of PeachFunded.com uh, here with uh, Buzz Brockway and Scott Turner, both uh, returning for the second episode of the Peach Funded podcast. Buzz, Scott, thanks for joining. Thank you. For, yes. So not, I guess it, since the last episode we did, there hasn't been a whole hell of a lot going on, I, which is kind of not true. Where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> I said, which is kind of not true, Scott. <laughs> yeah, I, I jump all over you. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. I, mean, I, I have been in Washington, D.C., which when I'm in D.C., I don't have as much time to pay attention to what's actually going on, which is the hints to lack of posts for me this week. But I did get two up last night. But um so I, I guess catch. Let's just do a quick catch up since the last podcast. What's gone on the past couple last week or so? Uh, well, yeah, we're going to have to talk about elections. Um, I think <laughs> is, it's it's the, the news that dominated the week for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, and we can dive right into that if you want. No, absolutely. Do it. Yeah. So, uh, I did a piece on that's posted that where we break down on Peach Pundit. We break down every section, every line of the bill that, that passed out of the house this week. Um, and if you can go, if you're a nerd like me, that's what I did on Monday night. I just decided I was going to have a lot of fun uh, marking up and, and marking down and marking over and crossing out and making notes on that particular piece of legislation. So I condensed the 66 page omnibus bill into seven pages and you can find out everything it does there. I watched most of the debate. Some of it I just couldn't stomach and I had to get up and walk away and take a break. Um, the The debate was really racially charged. Uh, the bill and the coverage around the, the, the bill has been racially charged. And I can't really honestly and objectively say that a little bit of it, not all of it, certainly not all of it, but a little bit of the criticism when you draw, draw it like drill down on the details is warranted. And when I say a little bit, I do mean it's a little bit, but certainly not every idea that came out of that piece of legislation was a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, it did pass by a very stark uh, partisan party line vote. Uh, it was 97 to 72. Um, it doesn't get it, much closer than that. Were there any flips on either side? None. Okay. Zero, uh, which is also surprising um, that the the Republican caucus primarily could stick together like that on it. Um, although the last elections bill, there's only one Republican in the entire General Assembly that voted against that one. And I have personal knowledge that he's no longer in the legislature. So <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's that. Um, but the, the bill Abe itself Ryan's with uh, not burner. Yes, yes, it, it does. Actually, that's really good, Buzz. That was fantastic off the cuff there. Uh, yeah, I was the only Republican that didn't vote for the last elections bill. Uh, and primarily because I said at the time, nobody's going to trust these machines. We're wasting our money. Buzz, Buzz, where are you? What, do you, what's, what kind of sense do you make about the election debate? Because he, Scott's right, it's racially charged. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of things flying around. I saw yesterday, speaker, I posted this on Peach Funded, but where Speaker Ralston's now coming out in, in favor of a, a free ID, not just for voter ID, which we already have free voter ID, but a federally compliant voter ID that you can use yeah. on you know, TSA and, and other things like that. So what do you make of the debate right now? It certainly seems like if this thing works through whatever version the that finally becomes law either the house omnibus bill or the senate's you know the senate bills that it's going to come down on party li party lines and there's federal litiga litigation that is almost certainly to follow yeah absolutely it this this will all be settled in court someplace uh i i think you know the uh i think it's a, a, i'm happy that the republicans are not trying to completely roll back uh, no excuse absentee voting I think that's that's good. I'm glad they're not doing that. Uh, I, I, in the I, House, at least. In the House, at least. Correct. Yeah. In the House, at least. Um, and, and the Senate has not passed such a bill, but I, you know, there, there's one more day before crossover, so we'll uh, uh, we'll see what they do. But I, so I think that's good. Uh, I'm I'm not opposed, and I think polling actually backs this up that there's there's a a, a reasonable bipartisan support for the concept of uh, per, you know, requiring folks to produce a voter ID of some sort uh, when they fill out their absentee ballot application. So I think, you know, I, I, I think overall, it's the, the rhetoric, is, as Scott described, I think he's described it accurately, 
and you know just we have to be honest in Georgia uh, politics co covers uh, you know influences every political discussion unfortunately uh, that's just where we are so I think um, you know that the the rhetoric is somewhat overheated the bill is not as scary as opponents would have you believe does as Scott described in his post there's a lot of technical fixes here and there that really don't you know amount to to very much uh, but are probably very necessary uh, to to improve elections in Georgia. The, I mean, the big, the, you know, the, the couple items that I think are the biggest deals in there are uh, requiring you know a, a cutoff time for requesting an absentee ballot. I think it's 11 days before the uh, before the election. Uh, that's kind of a big deal. And I talking to some friends, I I, I think that many other states have that, but I, I'm not sold on that provision. Uh, uh, and of course, the, the voter ID for absentee balloting, and then uh, I guess two other components of it that are that I'm sure Democrats are upset about is no poll worker from outside a county. In other words, you have to be a resident of that county to be a poll worker in that county. And apparently, what happened in the last election were, I mean, look, because of the pandemic, uh, poll workers were at a premium, and some. Uh, groups, uh, maybe leaning left groups, uh, came in and said, we will provide all the poll workers you need. And, uh, you know, that that raises some questions and some issues. Uh, uh, so, you know, I'm sure that's why that provision is in there. And then um, you're talking no about the, uh, the training requirement. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a training requirement yeah. for poll watchers, not necessarily poll workers, but poll watchers. Yeah. People who are observing the elections. Yeah, that that could be trouble. You know, I can see why Democrats would oppose that. And then uh, the other one was no, uh, you know, banning the use of private money to pay for various things. There were groups uh, that were coming in. And uh, I guess I think if I may be mistaken on this, but I think that the paying for the drop boxes was uh, private money uh, that paid for that. And somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But there were some things like that that happened that, you know, we can debate those. I think it's reasonable to debate those, whether that's, you know, whether it's good policy or bad policy to allow those things or ban those things. Um, and I guess the other one that uh, that may cause a lot of heartburn for Democrats would be there was there were maybe just in Fulton County, maybe only one of them kind of mobile voting uh, locations. And, um, you know, that that uh, other states use that. Um, but I don't think it's widespread. It does, it does raise, you know, I guess one, one debate over this is there's a lot of thought in the legislature. And, and I remember this from my time there. And as Scott mentioned, we were both on the governmental affairs committee, which dealt with election law. There's a real concern that voters in every part of the state be treated the same and have the same access to voting as every other part of the county. So when things like, would come up like Sunday voting, uh, rural uh, legislators would say, well, that's just not fair because we can't afford uh, to keep our polling places open an extra day. It costs us extra money and we're strapped already um, and things like that. And so mobile voting is one of those things. H how, do you, how do you ensure that every voter, when there's a mobile voting site that can just pop up anywhere, uh, you, you can see how that could you know, that could be placed in strategic places to maximize the turnout of certain uh, types of voters. And you could see how that kind of opens itself up to fraud. So, but, so if you're going, well, not fraud, but, you know, uh, encouraging certain results. So I, I think, you know, all these things should be debated and talked about. Uh, if you're going to have mobile voting in one place, well, then, you know, you should, you should allow them anywhere. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't, you know, all, all of these, um, uh, so many of these things, I think you need to ask questions like mobile voting and, and drop boxes and all these sorts of things. Do they increase turnout? Uh, the answer is probably no. Well, and that's, and, and that's part of the, I mean, that's, and we, I think we touched on this uh, last week was if you're, or I, I can't remember if it was, it was a conversation I was involved in last week, maybe on this podcast, I don't remember. But it seems Republicans, there, there is too much of Republicans trying to use election security or election reform basically to, to 
tamp down turnout. And, and mm-hmm. that's, that's the perception, whether it's real or not, that is certainly the perception aided by what the media is talking about and things like that. And certainly on, <clears throat> on Monday or Tuesday, I think it was Tuesday, I had the debate on HR1 uh, at the federal level uh, going in the background while I was working. And I heard Zoe Lofgren, who's a Democrat from from California, she's the chair of the House Administration Committee, and she was specifically mentioning that Georgia had had just passed, uh, had just moved some of these bills through one house. I mean, she was talking about that as as a reason, like this is designed to uh, to suppress people from voting. Uh, let me do. Either of you feel like that that is uh, uh, that perception is actually reality, or is it just simply that perception? We often know that perception is reality, but is there factor? Is it factor? Is it fiction? Well, I think it's because there are some bills that are not included in this piece of legislation that passed. You know that very clearly are designed to make it harder to vote by mail or absentee. Um, that Democrats picked up on the meme that there were Republicans trying to do this, and they attached this. They attached that that story to this piece of legislation. Now there are the, some of this is not great stuff. You know the requiring. Uh, if you're going to be a poll watcher from now on, if this bill becomes law, um, you end up with a, um, a requirement to have training. Uh, the materials would be required to be provided by the Secretary of State. You have to be a member of a party. Um, you know, political party, as we know, is very narrowly defined in Georgia. So no more third party poll watchers it would have to be party only. Um, you know, those are the types of things that, that can be kind of stinky uh, if, if you're, if to use a technical term in legislative uh, parlance, but, um, you know, and then they shrunk the time down to 78 days for when you can apply for a ballot. So that, you know, some of these things are not great. They don't, they're not going to increase the ease of voting. Um, they, and and an, I think a valid argument can make be made that some of the things would make it marginally more difficult, but how more more difficult is is to be seen. A couple of things that they did uh, for that were actually good is they uh, rank choice voting is in here for overseas and military ballots. So yeah. we have these really long drawn out campaigns because of our runoffs having to get uh, our runoff ballots overseas and then back. Uh, this would. Um, basically make it so that we don't have to have those really long periods for the runoff um, ballots the, anymore. The right hates that though. I mean, just generally speaking, like yes. I per- person, personally, I'm a huge fan of ranked choice voting and have been, well, I mean, it's a Republican bill, not a single Democrat voted for it. And was all Republicans. No, you know? but the same thing, <laughs> happened, the same thing Nationally. happened. Yeah. The same thing happened in Pennsylvania where the, the you know, they're complaining about all these changes that were done it's like you know ahead of not 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 talking about the actual court changes that where the court mandated you know that uh, you know return or ballots could come in after the after election day, but some of the the things that allowed certain steps to be taken by you know the Secretary of State and the Elections Division, the Secretary of State's office in Pennsylvania, they were saying, well, this is you know this is Democrats do it getting their getting their way. It's like this was a Republican legislature that passed this bill. Like, I don't think right. you know what you're talking about. Right. And, and, and I should qualify or amend what I said. I, I'm a fan of rate choice voting, but before rate choice voting, there was instant runoff voting, which I was a huge fan of and, and really thought that could save municipalities and counties money when it comes yeah. to, because Georgia's costly runoff system, which I'm surprised. And Scott and Buzz, you may know this better than I do. Cause I haven't, I haven't, this is never, this issue set has never been one I really cared for too much. And, uh, except for when I was in the Libertarian Party and I was concerned about ballot access and, and things like that. But, and I should note, I have rejoined the Libertarian Party. No no comments, please. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, come on, you guys can't blame me. Um, sure can. <laughs> <laughs> but has there, has there, in, is, is there, has there been legislation introduced? Is there anything that, uh, that's a part of this bill that's designed to uh, sort of bypass the existing or change the existing runoff system that we have, or even suppress it. Their- there, yeah. there was a, there was a bill introduced uh, by representative West Cantrell at one time it had um, bipartisan support. And I'm not going to call out any Democrats. Cause I know uh, from what I heard, uh, you know, unbelievable pressure was brought by the democratic party. They wanted not, not necessarily against ranked choice voting. They just wanted to, they want to stand unified against any election bill that Republicans introduced and this mm. fell victim to that. Uh, well, but there, there is bipartisan support for ranked choice voting. 
yeah. at least well, Wes's bill, Wes Cantrell's bill is actually in 531. The yeah. the ranked choice voting language that passed in 531 was the bill that uh, Wes Cantrell introduced. Yep. And uh, the the you know the left initially decided to participate and this members of the Democrat party yeah. in the house had decided they wanted to be part of that uh, uh, process. However, a lot of them took their names off of it. I know at least one of them kept their name on it. Um, but that language is now in the in that bill. There were a couple of things that they, that really kind of stood out during the debate that they that the Democrats pointed to and said that this is reason why we need this bill to fail, which would and some couple of them were a little bit head scratching. One of them was the the prohibition on passing out anything of value while people are waiting in line. Um, you know, uh, for example, a bottle of water. You know, or, you know, the, the, there is a member of the house currently. It was very famously caught on video passing out pizza to people who were at a polling place while he was on the ballot, right? And and you just can't do that. You can't pass right. out pizza. You can't campaign when you're a certain distance from the the polling yep. place. And the left, they were just freaking out about it. They, they several members went to the well and made it part of their speech to say, oh, "I'm not even allowed to give somebody a bottle of water when they're voting." It's like, yeah, never mind that it has my campaign logo on the side of it. Uh, you know. There were uh, there were food trucks in in various early voting locations in Gwinnett County. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this this has become a thing. I I just a, a funny personal story. One uh, uh one time uh in an election, a primary, I was unopposed I, I go to the polling place to vote. And then I thought, you know, these folks are, you know, there, there's going to be like, you know, a hundred people show up at this polling place throughout the entire day. So I went to uh, Dunkin' Donuts and bought some donuts and coffee and brought it back. A member of my elections board found out and called me and chewed me out. So <laughs> the, uh, they're very, you know, they're very protective of that uh, that space, as they should be. I give you state former state representative Buzz Brockway, one time candidate for Secretary of State. Uh, <laughs> hey, everybody's got to learn somewhere. Right? No, I no, I I I, to, I totally get it. That's just you guys had fun with me earlier, which is not going to make it in the podcast, and you know, people have no context for what I'm saying right now. So I'm just giving Buzz a hard time. Um, so, we, but I think yeah. Jason, one one point I, I really want to stress, I, I think. You know, we know there are large numbers of Republicans who were convinced that the election was stolen and that was there was funny business that happened all over the place. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to debate all that, but I, I think, you know, re Republican members of the legislature are responding to their base. It's a it's a much tamer bill than uh, than a lot of the people uh, who were advocating for bills to be introduced wanted. However, the ultimate the, the ultimate thing that Republicans are going to have to face is they didn't Donald Trump did not lose Georgia because too many people voted. Donald Trump lost Georgia because yeah. not enough people voted for him. That's right. And that's you know, Republicans have to come to grips with that and realize you can you can do anything you want to the laws. But ultimately, you're going to have to go out and win the hearts and minds of voters if you want to win elections. No, Buzz. Buzz is absolutely right. Now, before I change gears, because I do want to discuss um, uh, the president's statement yesterday. I don't know if you guys saw it, but I do want to to tell people you can go find uh, Scott's post. Uh, what the House Omnibus Elections Bill actually does at Peach Fund, and it was posted on March first. Scott it was a really good piece. Um, and uh, I, I think the one thing I appreciate about both of you guys is, and because I try to do this too, is to break break policy issues down in the sim most simple language possible so people can understand it because. You sh it shouldn't take a law degree to to read right. legislation, which I know the three of us are none of us are lawyers, and uh, although we all work with lawyers, uh, so pretty regularly. But uh, so I do want to go back to touch on this because this was news and it didn't make it in the agenda uh, for this podcast. But it, uh, it's, Buzz, you kind of called attention to it because I and I got something quick and dirty up on this at FreedomWorks. All right, FreedomWorks. God have mercy uh, at Peach Funded yesterday. Um, a lot of changes in my life recently, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Brian Kemp said the other day, he was on Neil Cavuto's show on Fox, I think it was Fox News. And he said he would he would support Donald Trump in 2024. What he and that's the way the headlines uh, have been reading. But he, what what Kemp said, he said he uh, what he actually said was he would support the Republican nominee in 2024. If it was President Trump, uh, former President Trump, he would do that. He said, I'm going to support the nominee, uh, although he did acknowledge that Trump had um, had changed the Republican Party for at least a few years to come. Uh, but Trump uh, 
attacked Kemp uh, the same day or the day after uh, in a statement saying to set the record straight, there were two reasons the Senate races uh, were lost in Georgia. First, Republicans did not turn out to vote because they were angry and disappointed with Georgia Republican leadership and Governor Kemp for failing to stand up to Stacey Abrams and the disastrous consent, consent decree uh, virtually eliminating uh, signature verification requirements across the state and in parentheses much worse and was not approved by the state legislature as required by the Constitution, having a major impact on a uh, on the result, comma, a rigged election. Run on sentences to hell. Uh, <laughs> and, and I mean, that's I realize it's two paragraphs uh, te- or it's two sentences technically. And it is one paragraph, but that is the worst sentence fragmentation in run-on sentences I've ever seen in my he, entire he life. You can't even blame the 280 character limit on on Twitter anymore because he, you know, that that's. No, you're right. I, so I, I guess, I guess uh, my question, Buzz, because you were you were mentioning this, a lot of people do believe uh, that um, that uh, the election was stolen in Georgia. There is no evidence of any sort of widespread voter fraud. I tend to believe the numbers that Gabriel Sterling was talking about during his press conferences, examples, you know, where, where there's, they, they were claiming this, but this is the actual number reality. I have no reason to question those numbers. Um, what do you guys make of a statement like this? Like this is, I mean, I, yes, it's Trump. He has a base. The, the, the Republican base loves him, but, but what do you guys make of this? And ter- especially because Brian Kemp's going to be up for re-election in, you know, two, like in November of next year. Yeah, I mean, Kemp has to really thread the needle. He, he's, you know, he was elected on the strength of rural turnout uh, uh, three years ago. Uh, that's where his, his biggest base of strength is. Uh, they turned out in large numbers for him. They also turn out in large numbers for Donald Trump. So, you know, he's, he, can't, he can't break with Trump completely. Although, you know, he... He certainly did when it came to actions and what he was asked to do uh, slash told to do by Trump at a, at a number of instances, he chose not to do that. He chose to do something what he thought was was best. So, well, what he's he got to fi- run that fine line. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but he was he he was required to do what he did by yeah. the law. Right. He wasn't allowed to do more than he did yep. by the law. So Kemp was acting lawfully, you know, he wasn't, he he didn't have authority to intervene in the manner in which it was demanded that he intervene. Um, You know, if, if he had called a special session, there was, there weren't enough votes in either chamber to overturn the election. It just wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. Um, So I don't know where this idea comes from that this was all Brian Kemp's fault. It certainly wasn't, you know, it, yeah, well, Kim, Kim, Kim signed the certification. That's what Trump's pissed off about. Let's just be clear yeah. about that. He He's required to. I know. Right. By law. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, no, Scott, Scott, we are rational people who understand <laughs> that. Right. So you asked me, the question was, what do I make of it? And, you know, <laughs> here's the thing. We are a party and, and, and we are, it, despite what you want to hear in the media, we are a very large tent party. There's a place like me, there's a place for somebody like me in the party. There's a place for somebody like Mitt Romney in the party. There's there's a place for somebody like Rand Paul in the party. And there's a place for somebody like Tom Cotton in the party. You know, there we are a large, very large tent. There, we are not monolithic in our ideology. And we, we I think the common thread is we wanna keep go- as government as small and out of your life as much as possible as much as possible so um we're not going to be libertarian on the, the podcast is smirking so yeah well uh, you know yeah <laughs> no i mean that's I, why I, I i emphasized that no i i i will i will concede my libertarian my small l libertarianism more classical liberalism is is very pragmatic in its approach and and, yeah. and my my joint rejoining the libertarian party is not uh it's more of a rejection of it's the same reason i didn't vote in the 2016 election at all. And the same reason I wrote in Senator Mike Lee in the 2020 presidential election. I didn't vote for Joe Jorgensen. I'm an independent voter. I can vote for whoever the hell I feel like it. And, and, right. uh, and yeah. yeah. But at the end of the day, w- what we do as a party is we come around our nominee, you know, and, and if that nominee is Donald Trump, that's who we vote for. And 
I remember very clearly thinking I had 16 other choices. Because, you know, there were only two I didn't want to vote for when they were running in 2016. And, you know, I was certainly, a, I was never a never Trumper, you know, but I had other candidates that I preferred and I supported multiples before I got to Donald Trump. Yep. When Donald Trump was a nominee, I was out there. I actually traveled the state to campaign for him. Um, so that's what we do. So it's, it's, it shouldn't be a headline. It shouldn't be news that a Republican governor is going to support the Republican nominee, no matter who that is. That's what we do as a party. That's what party politics. That's, that's exactly what party politics is. When we have think, a nominee, I, we get behind them. I, th I think an, an important point that, that uh, another thing that Republicans are Republicans who don't like Trump are going to have to come to grips with if they don't want him to be the leader of the party, they're going to have to go out and, and, offer another alternative and get people to rally around different, uh, you know, a different person or different group sets of ideas or whatever. You know, one, part of the problem uh, that Republicans uh, did in 2016 in the lead up to the 2016 uh, primaries, they thought that Trump would fade away on his own and he didn't, he right. kept getting stronger and nobody that, you know, the, the part, the, the numbers of people who didn't want him to be the nominee didn't were unable to or unwilling to rally around one person to put forward to to uh, beat him part of that so was the, part of that was the if media he runs again he'll win unless somebody comes up and beats him but part right. of that was part of that was the media part of that was the the oh, sure. because, I mean, for years you know sean hannity neil bortz and so many others rush limbaugh you know r.i.p and so many others were were talking about how evil the mainstream media was and that they were never going to say anything positive about conservatives and you have the media consistently and you know almost in, in never endingly attacking donald trump uh some of it justified a lot of it wasn't justified a lot of it was just you know you're you're jumping the shark here um and and so of course conservatives tend to flock to those people who who t who are quote unquote owning the libs yeah. um guys we spent about 30 minutes on this i want to move on to something else because we have mm -hmm. a couple other things i want to get to today uh so uh by new administration comes in they haven't gotten all their people in place yet but certainly things related to health care uh, javier becerra who is the nominee for hhs still working his way through the senate confirmation right now I don't think the CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, Administrator, has been confirmed yet, uh, but I haven't followed it closely. But the administration obviously is is moving quickly to put its pri policy priorities in place, especially when it comes to health care. And I know Georgia got a section uh, a section uh, uh, 1115 waiver uh, during the Trump administration, but it, it appears that that's being somewhat um, played with uh, by the, the nascent Biden administration, as it were. So uh, I think, Scott, I'll, I'll start with you here. What's, what's, what's happening around that? I think Buzz is probably uh, better with the, his fingers on the pulse with Georgia's Center for Opportunity um, to kind of, I can tell you as a legislator, I didn't like the bill that we passed that authorized the governor to seek out this 1115 waiver. I do think it is an expansion to Medicaid. Um, but uh, it was our program, and it was it was what we were using as a state to kind of fill the gap um, and uh, create our own marketplace. And they were trying as much as possible to um, what am I looking for? They're trying as much as possible to maintain as much free market influence as they could, creating our own exchange essentially, um, even though they didn't call it that, uh, uh, because there's another piece of legislation I know passed many years ago that prohibits Georgia from establishing their own exchange, but uh, giving the ability for us to take the number of dollars that we'd be getting for, for Medicaid expansion and making tax credits for people so they can go buy their own. And so there was a free market capacity, a little bit of a free market. You can't call it free market because it's tax dollars that are being allocated this way, but it allowed for Georgia to take the total number of dollars down and then um, disperse them as they wanted. Buzz, did you want to well, yeah, and, and unfortunately, the Trump administration didn't approve all of it, uh, so that funding piece was not as as generous as Governor Kemp had hoped it would be. But yeah, what Biden, what the Biden folks have done, the the interim or the acting CMS uh, head, is moved the 1115 waiver out of the approval cate approved category into the pending category, and given Georgia 30 days to respond, which I think the 30 days comes up uh, next week. So that that's you know, that's that's pretty harsh, 
uh, and then you know we'll see what happens after that. But it, it's it seems clearly to me it, it's it's designed to back Georgia into a corner and try to force Georgia into fully expanding Medicaid uh, all the way up to the 138 uh, federal poverty level expansion that uh, that they that they, Obamacare uh, initially envisioned would would be the case. So well, let's I mean let's also be honest. I mean like there's stuff in the 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 that Democrats want to move on COVID uh, in, in COVID relief that would expand the expand mm -hmm. at least temporarily is going to put Georgia in a pretty tough, uh, tough spot yep. um, as far as it goes. But like, let's like, does Georgia have any, any recourse here in the courts? Because if they were approved at one point in time and now it's being taken away, what can Georgia do uh, through federal courts and uh, potentially up to the Supreme court? Granted, that's going to take time. What can they do Scott or uh, Buzz? Some experts that I've read think that Georgia has a great case in court <laughs> uh, because it was already approved and it was approved uh, for five years. So the, the Trump administration envisioned it lasting past the next term, of, at least the first term of the next president, or uh, I suppose they were thinking through the end of Donald Trump's second term. So it, uh, I, I think, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, other, some attorneys out there think that, uh, that Georgia would have a strong case in court, and that's probably where it'll end up. Okay. Uh, so keeping in the, in the healthcare in the healthcare space, I, I, I know Scott, you flagged this for me. HB uh, 290. It's a bill that would prevent hospitals from keeping loved ones from visiting patients in hospitals or long term long term care facilities. It passed out of committee this past week. Um, does that bill have any any hope of passage before crossover day? Which what Monday or Tuesday? Monday. 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 Yeah, uh, I certainly hope so. It's uh, Representative Ed Setzler uh, from Ackworth. Uh, he's been working on this. It is it is watered down compared to the way it was initially introduced. Um, it is now a bill that would allow for a person to visit somebody in a extended care facility, like a retirement home or nursing home, uh, for at least one hour a day to be their advocate. Uh, and it can be a family member. It can be a professional. Um, but you have to give that, you have to give them a, an hour a day to have access to that advocate. Um, it is, it's watered down compared to where it was before. Before it was a, you cannot prevent somebody from seeing their loved ones if they're dying kind of uh, scenario, which I think almost universally, we are kind of disgusted by this idea that our loved ones who are elderly in these facilities are not allowed to see their loved ones on their last days. You know, it's absolutely unconscionable. Uh, and I understand that there are some health concerns, but what we've learned is we, the, we can manage uh, COVID in a way that where, you know, we can prevent these major outbreaks. It's not as scary as it was a year ago. Now, I'm not saying it's not serious and somebody will take my words and spin it. You know, it's still very serious. And I'm sure healthcare professionals know what they're doing to keep people safe so that they can visit their loved ones. Well, healthcare, I mean, we, we've learned how to treat the disease. We've learned how to treat the virus. And, and, and that's one reason I think, yes, the death toll has been horrendous, uh, you know, half a million mm -hmm. who, who've died, but, you know, it could have been a lot worse. And, but thankfully, healthcare professionals have figured out how to mitigate the symptoms to the best they can. In addition, let's case counts are they're on the decline right now, which is in part because of vaccinations. But, you know, with more and more people going out these days, because I'm noticing it no matter where I go, you know, from Georgia to Washington, D.C., there are more people out and about. So we're figuring out how to manage the disease. And it, it certainly seems like this bill would be something uh, just from conversations I've had with people who have had loved ones who have died, like those last days, it could have a, you know, the person who is who is sick and who might pass uh, it could be an uplifting thing for them to see their family before they pass away. You know, I mean, and that's, it certainly gives the family a better opportunity for closure, Scott. Yeah. And, and you know, and it's, it's sad to me that this is a, a partisan issue, but apparently it was, uh, I didn't watch the committee debate. I read an article, which is dangerous by the way, for me to rely on something that's been printed in somewhere by somebody else. But you are reading um, past the headline thing. Philip. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I am reading past the headline, but you know, there was, there, you know, be win, uh, was quoted in the AJC as having serious concerns around the bill, and it made it seem like uh, the Democrats were opposed in that particular article, um, which would be tragic. I think this is something that we could get around universally and say, you know, when our loved ones are on their deathbed, we should be allowed to go visit them. It just seems cruel that the government would, would allow uh, some sort of opposite intervention there. Yeah. yeah. Um, Buzz, you have any thoughts? Well, I just think that, yeah, you know, some of the most 
heartbreaking stories were those stories of families whose loved ones spent their last days alone. And uh, I just, I can't imagine anything worse than that. And, and some of the most infuriating stories were where certain, you know, certain powerful people were allowed to skirt these rules uh, because of who they were, uh, but regular folk could not. And I, I yeah. think, you know, uh, scan Twitter and you, you hear these stories a lot and, yeah. uh, and it, it's, it's infuriating and, uh, you know, as Scott, I echo Scott's sentiments. It's, it's, it's a shame. It's a partisan issue. Uh, and, and I think it's, you know, in, you know, emblematic of everything about COVID has just become partisan and uh, just, you, you just have two different worldviews of how to, how to deal with this where many yeah. Democrats are just, everything has to be shut down even still uh, and, and until uh, there are, uh, all, you know, I don't know what they want, zero cases or, or yeah. what, I don't know, but um, you know, we, we just, uh, the, we can't live that way. And, uh, and as a society, we just can't do it. It's too cruel. And there are all sorts of other problems that arise from that mental illness and, uh, you know, suicide attempts and all these sorts of things among kids are, are especially among kids and college age uh, individuals is skyrocketing. Uh, so you can't, you just can't do this. Yeah. So, uh, since it's COVID related, just real quick, uh, you know, California ended there, or Gavin Newsom of, of the governor of California criticized Texas for ending their mask mandate. And they asked Governor Kemp on CNBC, he went on the, uh, an interview this week, it was on in the morning in Squawk Box, and they asked him, you know, what do you think of Texas ending their mask mandate? He's like, we never had one. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, yeah. and it's like, you know, we left that to private business, which is, yeah. it was their decision. If they yeah. wanted to have it, they could have it. And, 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 and and literally everywhere you go, it's like we, we require masks. Now, some places don't enforce it, but like, I mean, Publix, yeah. Walmart, Kroger. Oh, uh, yeah. Everybody. Costco will hand you one if you're walking into Costco without one, yeah. you know, it's. Yeah, I've Quick. been shopping in, you know, I've been shopping, you know, around here and masks in Gwinnett County, masks are prevalent. Every business asks you to wear them. I have, I have never in the past year, I have never seen a confrontation over masks. Uh, I would expect 90 to 95% of people that I see are wearing masks. It's a little different in rural Georgia. I've gone to, I have family in rural Georgia and I've been shopping in, you know, in stores up there. It's, it's less, but it's not zero. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, it's so, you know, f we, we can do this. Have, have either, have, I, I, I don't think I've asked this. If you guys don't want to answer the question, that's fine. But have either of you had COVID? No, my, my, I have a daughter who uh, just a few weeks ago had COVID and thank the Lord, it was a very mild case. Uh, but that's it. But I, I you know, I, I do know people who died, uh, who passed away. And I know people who's, who have loved ones who passed away. Uh, so yes, it's, it's touched our lives. Scott. Yeah. No, uh, I have not. I've been exposed, obviously that kind of made national headlines. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't had it. I had, I did early on have to quarantine because their tests were not available and um, spent 14 days hold up in a room in my home because I have a hospice patient that lives with us, which is an added level of joy. So we, we, because we have somebody who's really medically fragile living with us, we take extreme precautions. Uh, we are masking up and we limit our trips out still even now. You mask um, up just, inside the house? No, 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 okay. no, not, not in home, but like when we go outside to, when, and I don't see you outside, uh, that's incorrect. If I'm going grocery shopping, yeah. I'm masked up. Yeah. If I'm, you know, if I have to go to the gas station, I run into the convenience store, I'm wearing a mask. Yeah. You know, uh, these now, are, you know, and I was we limit at, our trips, you know, we only, yeah. we, we, you know, we, we wait until we actually have to go out. Yeah. yeah. I, I was, at, I was in downtown Covington this afternoon, uh, to run, uh, to buy a, a birthday gift and to, get we have these dumps out here these convenience centers that you have to buy a pass for so i had to go buy one of those today because we have a we buy so much crap on amazon we have just like mountains of boxes that just <laughs> that just wind up in our house but i wore one around the square the whole time and i was like you know more than half the people who were walking around the square in covington which there were a surprising number of people out at like one o'clock this afternoon great it was a nice day a lot of, yeah but most of them were not wearing masks <clears throat> and you go to dc i mean my new job I started this past week at the Due Process Institute in Washington, D.C., went up there Monday, Tuesday, <clears throat> drove home Wednesday. Uh, you know, we were requiring masks like inside the office. Like if you go in your office and you shut your door, 
you know, they don't care if you take it off, but if you're out in any common area, yeah, you got to take it off, you know, and, and I, look, do I think it's a rather extreme step? Eh, not extreme. No. I mean, they're complying with DC city order and I totally understand that. Uh, but you know, there are people who are, who are legitimately worried that, you know, even though they may not have any health condition that they know about that, you know, that they're worried about getting sick. Uh, my parents, my parents both had it. They're both up there over the age of 65. Um, my sister had it. My nephew had it. My youngest nephew surprisingly didn't get it. Uh, he had just had a liver transplant, but I do, I don't know anybody personally who's passed from COVID, but I know people who have family who have passed away from it. It's, it's, it's yeah. terrible. And it's, it's heartbreaking. You know, Buzz and I have several friends in our circle that have had it and fairly severe cases of it. Um, you know, one of our mutual friends uh, had to go to the hospital for pneumonia related to it. So I, I, it's very serious. And, you know, and, and it, it hits different people different ways. I have friends who had really mild cases. They simply lost their ability to taste food. And that was the yeah. only symptom they had. Yeah, the so. people the people I live with in D.C. when I'm in town, they're, they're the people I've been living with for, for, for basically the last five years. Uh, the the spouse, the wife, uh, she had pneumonia and COVID. She was hospitalized for about, I don't know, four, four days or so. And it was, hers was a rather severe case, but moving on to more fun topics. Cause I know COVID is not the, exactly the most fun topic in the world. Um, who the hell is going to run for the Republican nomination for United States Senate? And <laughs> I, know, I know Scott suggested we each bring, bring three. I have, I have none. Uh, except for the two, except for, except for the two of you who are currently on this podcast, I cannot think of anybody else who I would say, I, I got, I got to say guys, I, I'm looking at the, the, the slate of potential candidates and I'm just like, uh, there is nothing here, especially well, with, with Purdue. Get, I wasn't a big fan of Purdue anyway. Obviously I can't stand Leffler and, and, for, and would, would prefer she <laughs> never run for anything ever again up to and including dog catcher or tax commissioner. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Scott. I'm just, I'm just not there, man. Um, it's, it's, I mean, who, who? You're just a mean guy. I'm an asshole. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but, but who, 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 who? Tell me who. Um, can I throw out some names that, all right. So one of the reasons, this was the topic that I selected for the agenda. And the reason why is because I think it's time for us to begin planting the seed really early in an effort to recruit some candidates to go and run. Hey, uh, wild, and, wild, baseless speculation is the heart of all good yeah podcasting so yeah absolutely and i can guarantee you uh i i reached out to two of my candidates and told them hey i'm going to mention your name on this thing and they're like what what are you doing <laughs> um, so uh, that being said uh the first name i'm going to throw out is jody lott uh jody lott is a house rep she's a governor's floor leader uh a, a brilliant uh lady who is is really knowledgeable about healthcare policy and how federal policy has interacted with uh, state level health care uh she is a very compassionate human being uh extraordinarily bright and well spoken uh, i think she'd make a very compelling candidate and uh i hope i hope she uh, at least considers running she is and, not she's not a robot correct no absolutely oh. not and as a, a matter of fact um, she, she feels like at times she's been unfairly labeled as a troublemaker, uh, which is my type of legislator. Right. So, uh, I, I like Jody a lot. Uh, she, if, because she's a floor leader, she'd have some resources there and, um, she'd have some support, I think on a statewide basis that if she wanted to get involved at that level, she would make a very, very compelling candidate. Okay. I like it. She's from the uh, Augusta area. Yes. Uh, been in the house, what, six years now? Six. Uh, this, she's on her fourth term. Fourth, uh, in mm -hmm. her seventh year then. Yeah. I like it. Well, look, let me hear other ones. So who else you got, Buzz? You got anybody? Well, uh, one that I'll float out that um, um, I, I was scanning through Facebook the other night and, and a Facebook friend posted, I guess it was a day or two after Purdue had announced he was not going to run. And uh, a Facebook friend said, who in the, you know, kind of asked this question, who in the world is going to run? And a uh, Senator Greg Dolezal posted in that thread a little emoji, kind of a person raising their hand saying, how about me? Uh, so I, I don't know. I haven't talked to uh, the senator yet or not, but I, I found that interesting. And perhaps he is a person who is uh, thinking about it. And uh, why shouldn't be? Why shouldn't he? he? He's a smart, intelligent, conservative guy. Um, hails from Forsyth County, uh, a heavily, a heavily Republican area, a, a, a wealthy area where he could raise some money and 
and and I tell you, his his state senate campaign, he uh, he his when he announced he was running for state senate, there was a crowd of two hundred people who had signed up to volunteer for him, and he smashed all, scared a bunch of people out of the race and smashed all competition. So, hmm. um, you know. He's only been there a few years, but he's uh, he's a smart, capable guy. Cool choice advocate and the first mm -hmm. senator to get a term limits bill out of a committee hearing and get a vote <laughs> yeah. in a committee for a term limits bill. And he got, he got a term limits bill to rules with an actual committee vote. So yeah. a, a capable legislator. Uh, I will say he was on my list of three as well. And um, okay. so there you go. We, we match up on that one there. So let me let me get let's Buzz or Scott. Who's Scott, who's your third? Buzz, who's your second? Um, my third is another Forsyth County legislator, uh, and that is Re State Representative Todd Jones, mm -hmm. who is probably one of the smartest people left there after yeah. Buzz left. Um, the he's a unfortunately he's a Florida Gator. You know he graduated from University of Florida, uh, <laughs> but uh, an honorary uh, member of the Georgia Tech Caucus. I can uh, <laughs> Bert Reese just, and I may, uh, uh, adopted him. So yeah, he's just, that smart. Yeah, just lost my vote on multiple, <laughs> on, on multiple fronts. I, I know I know I shouldn't be that petty, but I'm dead serious. <laughs> so you're not voting for Herschel Walker either. Then. <laughs> I mean, he went to the University of Georgia. Okay. All right. All he, right. Was like the, he was like the god of the University of Georgia, but I wouldn't yeah, vote yeah, for, yeah. but I, I wouldn't vote for Herschel Walker for other reasons. Oh, okay. Because so, mainly because he was a Trump supporter. But Todd is um Todd is an analytical process driven thinker. You know, he's he I think he would bring a business savvy. He's extraordinarily business savvy. Uh, he's got international business savvy. He uh, has a lot of uh, energy policy background in his private life. I think that that would be applicable to the United States Senate. And uh, it's just a very solid policy mind. Um, uh, I, I think he could play the political game slightly better than he does now, uh, if I was going to give him any, cri any criticism. But other than that, I think he'd make a solid U.S. Senator. Well, I'll, I'll tell a I'll tell a story about Todd Jones. There was, when he first got elected, there was a an issue bubbling up in part of his district, in an area of Forsyth County, kind of known as Sharon Springs. And there were there was a passionate group of people who wanted a referendum to create a city, and there was a passionate group of people who were vehemently opposed to that. And Todd uh, held public hearings. He worked incredibly hard. And he came out of that that could have been an incredibly divisive issue that would take down uh, uh, some politicians. He came out of that with increased respect from both sides of the debate. They ended up having a, resol a, ref a, a resolution and uh, the, the measure failed. He had uh, one of the things he did, I think, was quite brilliant. He, he uh, raised the bar rather than just being a referendum where you needed 50 percent plus one. He, he moved it up to, I think it was 57%. And his, yep. th his reasoning was that, you know, and it was very smart, you do not want to create a new city that is, you know, that is evenly split. You, you, you kind of want a supermajority, almost a supermajority uh, of support if you're going to, because imagine trying to be a city councilman of a mm -hmm. city that passed by just a handful of votes. That would be a tough job. Yeah. And he navigated through that, earned respect from both sides, and so I think, yeah, it, it points to, uh, I know, you know, Scott mentioned he, he maybe needs to improve on political skills, but there's one instance where I think he navigated a tricky situation very well. Yeah. Uh, well, Buzz, you, I think you owe us one more. So who's your Yeah, I, I think uh, I, um, names that, uh, you know, these are not names that, uh, that I necessarily am endorsing or supporting, but I, I think, you know, as, as w uh, I think people that might be looking at it and might consider running, would probably include, uh, you know, as we mentioned before, with Purdue getting out, I think other other people might start looking at it that might not have previously. So I'll toss out the names of Burt Jones, who's a senator from Middle Georgia, and Brandon Beach, who's a senator from North Atlanta, uh, and and I, I think you know they it would not shock me. <laughs> it, would, it would not these are not endorsements. I'm just saying. Uh, these are the uh, you yeah, know wouldn't shock me if those two individuals were suddenly thinking about it now that there's kind of a void there, and I and I will say this about uh, both those candidates I'll tip my hat to Senator Beach, uh, he voted in favor this uh, this week of a special needs scholarship bill, he had opposed school choice bills in the past and he, but he voted for this one so I 
Um, I will, I, I applaud him for that. And Senator Jones uh, voted against that special needs bill. And I'll just say, if you want to run, if you want to gain the votes of conservative voters in this state, you need to support school choice. And uh, Senator Jones whiffed on that one. So uh, if he's thinking about statewide office, which apparently he is, he didn't get things off onto a good start there. <laughs> so I don't have three candidates, but I have three criteria. You have to learn how to message to communities of color and, and do it in an authentic way. And it has to be consistent and constant. You, you, like just Georgia Republicans have, or Georgia just has uh, – Georgia has a shifting dynamic here and Republicans have not been able to answer the call. And mainly because they can just, we talked about this last week, they redistrict themselves a majority that make uh, the majority and they're safe for 10 years. And then they'll redistrict again. Eventually you're going to run out of room and you're going to have to figure some, figure out a way to, to mitigate that. So, uh, so that includes messaging on policies that communities of color will rally behind. Uh, so that's criminal justice reform. That's immigration reform, um, school choice, school choice. Uh, so that, that's one criteria, I would say. A commitment, it doesn't have to be a commitment to, um, to well, it's a commitment to free fiscal conservatism, not because we obviously uh, just, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to take a look at the long-term budget outlook that the CBO released yesterday. It is frightening. Yeah. Uh, and and, and, and uh, something's going to have to be, modern monetary policy, for all intents and purposes, we have tried it before and it doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, so we have to figure out a way to address these issues through actual fiscal policy. And that means uh, a fiscal policy or and, and uh, uh, entitlement reform. Um, so someone who's going to be not just, I'll vote for that stuff, but someone who can actually present ideas uh, and bring those to the table. Uh, and, and then I think, I think finally it's going to have to be someone and I'm not a huge fan of identity politics, but it's either going to have to be someone who is uh, either a minority, a person of color, or a female. Uh, and they also, and just with that, it, it cannot be named Kelly Leffler. <laughs> Sorry, Scott. Um, <laughs> what did we miss, guys? It's, we got a few more, a couple yeah. more minutes. What did we miss today? What should we have discussed that we didn't get around to? Crossover day is on Monday. Uh, it'll be crazy. Uh, always is. Uh, you know, they've moved it to day 28. Uh, so that is Monday and crossover day for those who are uninitiated in Georgia politics is the last day you can get a bill out of one chamber and into the other so that the other will consider. So a house bill has to pass the house in order to be considered by the Senate and the Senate has to pass their bills to get into the house to, for consideration. Now, also, also for the uninitiated, uninitiated, is that, is that a constitutional or statutory? No, it's a Senate rule. It's not even a house rule. It's a Senate rule. Yep. Um, the Senate adopts that rule and then the House follows it uh, to the letter. Now, that being said, as a smart legislator, I will tell you that most of my bills uh, never crossed over, but I still got them passed. So uh, <laughs> there, I'll, I'll, leave are, that, yeah. I'll leave the mystery on how we actually do that uh, for some other time. Did the, did the speaker and or governor know that at the time? Uh, the LG definitely did. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> well since we're in the south we can say that there's always yeah. more than one way to skin a cat right yeah i had a bill one time that, that hit the desks in a conference committee report at 11 45 and a freshman legislator buzz wasn't here this was a couple of years ago i had a, a freshman legislator from across the chamber start hollering across the chamber scott scott your bill's in this conference committee i'm like shut <laughs> up man <laughs> <laughs> Buzz, you got anything for us? Anything we, we, we should have covered that we didn't get to today? Well, uh, you know, mentioned it last week, uh, you know, well, I, and I mentioned earlier, very happy that the Senate uh, passed uh, Senate Bill 47, the special needs scholarship uh, bill, which, it, which uh, fixes a loophole in that, that, that prevents lots of special needs students from participating in that program. I, I hope it will find favorable, uh, a warm reception in the House. Uh, and Wes Cantrell has uh, House Bill 60. It was on the calendar today. It was returned to rules. Uh, and, and hopefully, hopefully, will be brought back uh, to, the sent to the House floor on, on Monday. It uh, creates personalized education plans, uh, a program for the state of Georgia, which will allow kids to, uh, to uh, attend schools that will better meet their needs. And I, I, I hope that uh, our, the, our Republican legislators will pass that and send it over to the Senate. 
you know, we meant you, know, Jason, you talked about reaching out to minorities and the need for Republicans to do that. If, if they want to do that, they want to grow their base in Georgia, they need to embrace school choice fully. And I applaud the Senate for doing it. And I hope the House follows suit on Monday. Well, guys, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining this week. And I, we'll be back next week with another another uh, uh, Peach Funded podcast. Uh, Scott's got his awesome coffee mug right there. Those of you who are who are listening to the audio via Apple Podcasts can't see it, but it says freedom is my second favorite F word. Uh, so uh, thanks for listening. And uh, please go to peachfunded.com. We're going to get a link up at the top right column. Uh, that takes you to Apple Podcasts, so you can uh, get the podcast. You can subscribe there, or you can go. We don't have an official Peach Punnett YouTube account. We've just basically been using mine, my personal one. Uh, but we'll have the video at peachpunnett.com. So, folks, thanks for listening. Scott, Buzz, don't forget to like and subscribe. I right? I'm not you. good at saying that, but that's what you're supposed to say. So, download, yeah. like, and subscribe. Rate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, send us free things uh if you want to uh, yeah I'm, I'm open to that now so send me all the stuff <laughs> have a great weekend folks take care all right Bye. peace out <laughs>